much for being with us this afternoon. Now, there's already 8 gigawatt of electricity linked to the harbor of Imshaven, and the port could become the arrival point for the world's first hydrogen pipeline coming from an offshore wind farm, the 700 megawatt project, Ten Norden von der Wadden. Uh, how is the port of Imshaven? I'm really proud of myself to be able to say that, by the way. <laughs> how is the port of Imshaven getting ready for this? Yeah, uh, there are actually uh, uh, two wind farms who uh, will be in future in, in the connection, the grid connection to Eemshaven, this wind at Norden van der Wadden, and you pronounced it uh, perfectly. Uh, and also Door de Wind, which is another uh, Dutch wind farm which is planned. But we, as Eemshaven, we also have, we have already a lot of connections. Uh, grid connections, for instance, there's a... Uh, um, uh, a connection with Norway, it's called the Nordnet cable. There's a, a cable with Denmark, which is called the Cobra cable. And also actually the Gemini wind farm, the 600 megawatt wind farm. Also the converter station is in Eemshaven. And it helps because we also have a dual grid from Eemshaven uh, uh, by Tenet, the Dutch TSO. Uh, but of course, we're also um, looking for not only electricity to come, but also hydrogen to come. So that's the possibility. And yeah, we also have a grid connection because there in the northern part of Holland, there's the gas uni uh, uh, grid in the ground, which can be used also for storage. And we're seeing a picture of the or a graphic of the Nord H2 project of which you are part with. Uh, Gas Uni Shell, Netherlands Equinor and RWE, yeah. which wants to turn the region into the big, into one of the big, if not the biggest hydrogen hubs in the world. What kind of projects, or in Europe rather, what kind of projects can we expect also outside of the consortium regarding green hydrogen? Yeah, every 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 uh, company in the port is thinking and already pre-acting on hydrogen and as, as we have uh, yeah, several uh, companies in the port like RWE who's also on the table uh, but also Ekinor, Vopak, Engie they're all looking uh, at possibilities in the, in the hydrogen market um, and of course we are looking as a port um, uh, how can we facilitate? Eh? We do not produce hydrogen, we do not consume hydrogen, but we are, as a port and a region, an intermediate. So that is how we look and try to facilitate these kind of projects. And as a port, from the port perspective, what would you say are the hurdles to facilitate that towards a more green hydrogen world? Uh, first of all, um, um, the numbers which are coming in and um, where do you put all these electrolyzers because they are consuming quite um, a yeah, substantial uh, piece of land. So, um, and there's no, um, uh, not much land, it's scarce also in Eemshaven um, and we're looking for expansion. Um, and of course, and, and I th personally think that electrolyzers should not be uh, put on a, on a water-related uh, area, but you should do it uh, out of the out of the port. Uh, but it's substantial in order to yeah to, to to have these facilities. All right. Well, thank you very much, Erin Bertolet, for talking to us this afternoon. Um, one of the developers eyeing the Dutch market is Germany's RWE. You, Peter de Jong, you are the head of offshore hydrogen, and uh, you have projects in the Netherlands, but also in the German water. In German waters, tell us more about that. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you very much. You have cl closer. So close. Very enough? close. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, indeed. We have a number of projects. Uh, North H2 is uh, one of them, by the way. But uh, North H2 is, is is actually a combination of onshore development and offshore development, where the offshore development will probably kick in later, let's say uh, halfway through the 30s. 
Um, but the projects we're currently working on and are announced by the German government and uh, the um, uh, Dutch government is uh, the Zen 1 area in Germany, that's a hydrogen only tender. And the Demo 1 and 2 in the Netherlands, which are demonstrator projects. Uh, the Demo 1 is a 50 to 100 megawatt project. And the Demo 2, uh, mentioned here, uh, at, at, as you perfectly uh, pronounced it, ten noorden van de Wadden area. Um, and that's a 500 megawatt uh, area. And the Zen 1, by the way, in, in, the, in the Netherlands, uh, sorry, in Germany, mm. is around 300 megawatt. So those are really concrete projects which we are working on together still with the authorities because it's not totally clear how tender mechanisms will look like, subsidy schemes will look like, um, also permitting is obviously very important, uh, and the infrastructure. Um, that, that also need to be developed by either um, uh, uh, operators, pipeline operators, or infrastructural TSOs like in the Netherlands, for example, Gazuni. You were saying they're still at the demonstrator stage. What's your timeline looking forward? When are you hoping to reach the next stage, commercial stage? Yeah, very good question. So um, we, we, are, we are looking at a stepwise approach, both for technology uh, development as scale up. Um, uh, we, we also need really first of proof concepts, so to say. But the two projects I was just call, uh, talking about is around this 300, 500 megawatt. And the, I expect the projects after that to be the first commercial tenders. And that will be somewhere around 32, 33. And, and also the both authorities, in this case, uh, Germany and the Netherlands, are working on the North Sea roadmap for 2030, 2040 where I expect this to, uh, to be in. Well, we mentioned these two countries. Are you looking at any other countries with your company? Definitely. Uh, I totally agree with, uh, with the, 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 the previous speaker in the, in the other Eric? session. Uh, mm. uh, there's multiple countries looking um, into hydrogen roadmaps, and then they have uh, big ambitions. Um, but, but momentarily, I see uh, only the demonstrator announcements in Germany and, and the Netherlands. But for example, in Denmark, uh, we see a possibility of system integration in the, in the offshore tenders. Um, USA also really kicking in, not just by the RRA, but they also announced new technologies development, including offshore hydrogen. And what uh, you already mentioned, some of the hurdles. What other hurdles are there for hydrogen to really get going and grow, get, go big? Yeah, uh, it's, so it's, it's really the economics. And we really have to think of what is the most important for us. Obviously, uh, also like the former uh, uh, speaker said, if we want to have influence on the carbon emissions, then we should actually aim for the hydrogen um, industry itself at the moment. Uh, there's, there, there you can have the biggest influence. But that's also how they are using fossil fuels at the moment. Uh, that's mainly gas driven. So the production costs are, are fairly low. So we, we, we need a little bit of both, um, both um, uh, big volumes, but also where the market is already uh, viable, like for example, um, uh, transport. But the most important thing is that we do a combination with, for example, onshore development. Uh, onshore is a little bit ahead of us. I expect the, the onshore technology to, uh, to be available a couple of years before the offshore. Offshore is really focusing on the scale up. Onshore can pave the way for uh, the, the market development. And to what extent do you think, in that respect, uh, international cooperation is really important? Or is it a very competitive market right now and everybody's trying to get into the pole position? Or is everybody working together? I think we definitely should work together. If we, uh, not just from a demonstrator and technology point of view, but also from a market point of view. Um, if you want to have a level playing field, for example, between onshore and offshore, you actually need to talk about uh, one system, uh, one, one infrastructural system, and, and, and having a single entry point and a single e exit point. Because otherwise, there is not a level playing field. And that's not just within a country. That is also overarching the different countries, um, specifically Europe. Um, but we also need to take into account that everything we will, can or will import 
if it is green or maybe even blue, it should be levelized because otherwise uh, it, it's not going to fly. Is there the political will to push for more green hydrogen? I think so, yes. Um, um, and, and that's dr driven by two things. Uh, the Paris Agreement, of course, uh, we, we need to, uh, to, to, to come uh, to, um, uh, to level that. Um, but also, um, if, we, if we need to scale up, for example, the power production, uh, we, cannot, we cannot just do that and, and throw it into the uh, existing uh, grid. Capacity is simply not big enough, so we have to choose for a different way of landing the energy, and the hydrogen is one of the best solutions, I would say. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Thibaut de Clé de Maritsou, you have come all the way from Madrid to join us here today. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me. You're Vice President Europe at Floating Offshore Wind Energy Developer Blue Float. What projects linked to green hydrogen are you currently working on at your company? So we're working on very different projects in very different markets. So Blue Float has been, um, as it is a young developer, but we're already present in 10 markets. And what we heard before is that uh, hydrogen is going to grow globally. So every market, every roadmap related to offshore wind development and especially floating wind, to some extent, either includes today a combination or a connection to hydrogen, or it will come in time. Mm. We know that there's a big gap in terms of green electrons available, and offshore wind, and especially floating, that enhances the potential of offshore wind, will contribute. So in every market where we are present, we pursue different collaboration opportunities, and we look at what are the parameters that allow already now to consider developing combined floating or offshore wind and uh, hydrogen production. Because the alternate route to market is one option, as just mentioned, and we know that there will be some grid roadblocks in some markets or grid capacity might be delayed. And if you have a mechanism that allows to export your electricity within uh, another route, taking another route for hydrogen production, this can be an opportunity. You have also countries that are launching specific auctions that are not price driven but more innovation driven like the recent into ground in the uk and we were awarded two projects there and of course hydrogen is part of the story mm -hmm. so in any market we try to seek as an, an opportunity to open up to a combination between floating and, and hydrogen you also uh, i understand developing a new partnership in this area so we have several partnerships ongoing unfortunately i cannot make them public oh. right now i would have loved to <laughs> but uh, in this business, we, we adapt to, to the, the partners. But we are considering different partnerships depending on the markets where we are, because the conditions are different, as just mentioned before. And also, we know that the way to produce hydrogen will be different. And the maturity of the market, as I said, is quite um, can sometimes be a bit challenging in terms of what is possible locally because of the regulatory framework. So we're pursuing opportunities to produce hydrogen onshore, to combine onshore hydrogen production with our wind farms. We're looking at opportunities to produce offshore uh, and also even decentralized uh, production. We see the models on the slide here. So it offers a lot of routes, I would say, to, 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 to hydrogen uh, production, but with still a lot of challenges that we will need to address. Uh, and, and I think this is something we can, we can also touch on because regulatory frameworks and technology will be the next two challenges. Right. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes. What are these hurdles? Yes, of course. So I think there's a, we heard it, there's a real political willingness to develop hydrogen at a global scale. I think some studies say that almost 30% of the electricity produced by 2050 to some extent will be used for hydrogen production or the derivatives of hydrogen. So it's a huge amount of gigawatts of electrolyzers that will need to be installed. If we look at France today, we just have a few megawatts or tens of megawatts. And the roadmap is 6.5 gigawatts toward 2030. But we see that there's a new roadmap that is going to be communicated in the next days under discussion. And this will definitely increase the ambition. And the only way to achieve that is to produce uh, green electrons with a much higher capacity than we are doing today and offshore wind provides the scale and floating by going further from shore by enabling larger wind farms to be established 
is, is a great accelerator mm -hmm. uh, for, for hydrogen. But this requires to pass some technical barriers also. Today, electrolyzers have a lifetime of seven, 10 years when our offshore projects have a 20 to 30 lifetime uh, potential. So how do you deal with that? Some electrolyzers, or most of them, the technologies today are not mature to use seawater. So it means additional equipment. Mm. And of course, the LCOE at which you will produce your, your green electrons will have an impact on the price of hydrogen. So all these parameters will require to accelerate scaling up. Mm. And floating is scaling up, as offshore is globally. But there's going to be an acceleration in next years. And so we're very uh, convinced and very optimistic about the role that floating wind will play in, in the decarbonization and the production of green hydrogen going forward. OK, thank you very much. We still have a couple of minutes. Eric Berthollet, do you want to react to anything you've heard here? Agree, disagree, feel free. No, we can't hear you. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah I, I fully uh, agree. And I hear, again, the ambitions and um, the upcoming extended ambish, ambition, uh, not only on offshore wind, but also on, on hydrogen. But yeah, we can set up ambitions but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doubting whether we can make these ambitions work because yeah, where, where do we get the turbines? Uh, where do we get the installation uh, vessels? Where do we get the, uh, the grid connections? Where do we get the sufficient electrolyzers? Uh, especially what was mentioned by uh, the previous speaker uh, on, the, on the lifetime of, of electrolyzers compared to, let's say, uh, wind turbines. Um, yeah, there, there are not enough ports and not, not enough crane capacity. So you can set ambitions, but it, it's a challenge. May I react on that? Yes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really true. I mean, the, getting the supply chain ready to uh, the scale up, to be ready for the scale up envisioned, that's really a challenge, and 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 we need, really need more support from authorities. We need a, a more concrete project pipeline or tenders to be able to do that. That's the way you can onboard both supply chain and the offtake market. It's not just depending on some mad developers stepping into this uh, this opportunity. No, there, there there need to be a broader supporting structure coming. Uh, especially in Europe, of course, but, but also in the other countries, to be able to, to reach it. Only then you will also see scale up in, in for example, the supply chain. So I fully agree with, uh, with uh, Eric Bertolier. Eric yeah. from, uh, <laughs> exactly. from, from, the, from up north in the Netherlands. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for all your insight. I believe we have a drawing, if I'm not mistaken. It's coming. There we go. So, paving the way for the green hydrogen wave. We need support from governments, as you said, Peter. Uh, you talked about acceleration, Tibor. And, um, well, we need to work together offshore, onshore, and scale up to reach these goals. Thank you very much. As I said, Fanny uh, Didou, our wonderful graphic illustrator, she's listening in. And this is actually like taking notes. It's not just like a nice drawing. It is also a nice drawing, but it's actually the way she remembers things. So it's quite fascinating how fast and beautiful, beautifully she does this, isn't it? <laughs> well, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for coming all the way to Paris. Thank you.